Fishing is a threefold challenge. First, you must understand a species' habits and preferences. Second, you need to find them on any given day. And third, you need to figure out how to make them bite. I got you that time, you sucker. Yeah. That's a walleye too. Yeah. yeah. Successfully put all three factors together and you're likely to put fish on the line. While all fish share certain similarities, each species is uniquely different and the approaches for catching them vary. Oh, there's one, good one. Good Especially one. when the fish you're after make seasonal transitions in location and behavior. Today, on the edge, we're on the hunt for elusive pre-spawn crappies as they gather outside shallow spawning areas in spring. Then we chase cool cats on ice, targeting channel catfish during the winter season. In each case, the tactics are simple, although obviously tailored to the particular species we're after. The trick is finding the fish where they live, when they live there. And to do that, you need to predict their seasonal preferences by understanding and appealing to their basic nature. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. How you talking? Like that. that was perfect. Yeah. I like that. Then I don't even have to <laughs> Look at those barbells, aren't they something? Boy, yeah. Is that a pretty one? Yeah. Look at that thing now. Yeah. Look at it, he's talking to you too. Why take chances with your engines? Protect them from neglect, wear and tear the easy way with Seafoam Motor Treatment. Seafoam maintains optimum engine performance by removing harmful deposit buildup from your engine and fuel system. It controls moisture and gas and diesel, stabilizes fuels for up to two years, and lubricates your engines to start easier, run cooler, and last longer. Trust all your engines with Seafoam, the choice of mechanics for over 70 years. Are you finding it harder and harder to spend time with your family? All you need is the right place to reconnect. <laughs> Big walleye, Dad. Here we go. This is fun. 
Northwest Ontario, your place to reconnect. Closed captioning provided by iGOGS Quality Eyewear. We should be uh, covered for whatever the fish are doing. <laughs> you know that story. Yeah. Hey, every year Dave and I look forward to spring. Just like millions and millions of you do, we're going to go out on the water and chase crappies. You heard me right, crappies. And uh, there's a lot of different ways to catch crappies and most people will tell you the fish are either in or they're out, meaning that they're in the shallow cover or they're not there yet and they're not biting. Well, we know the fish are always biting. <laughs> we, may have to, uh, we may have to try a few different tactics to try to catch them. I'll tell you one thing, uh, the, the reports have been a little inconsistent. Our first stop is to gas up the boat, pick up a few munchies, and scope out the latest intel on the crappie bite. I got the local report from the gals inside here. We haven't heard anything good on, on a fishing report so far. Nobody's catching anything yet. Hmm. Even if the fish aren't biting, we will. Then we hit the launch, ready to roll. According to the locals, the crappie bite hasn't started yet. But just in case, we first do a quick visual scan of shallow reed beds where pre-spawn crappies gather once they penetrate the shallows in earnest. As expected, we saw very few fish. That means the crappies are still hanging out at the mouths of shallow bays, waiting to come in shallow to feed. Spawning still lies many weeks away. Next, we do some scouting and probing of likely deep weed areas to make contact with fish. You gotta find them before you can catch them, much like they did back in the caveman days when hunting for food. The difference is, instead of wielding pointed sticks, we have graphite rods, a fully rigged boat, electronics, and plenty of lure options so we're not exactly roughing it. The trick is getting the first bite. Crappies are notorious schoolers, so once we catch the first fish, there should be more nearby. Actually, I didn't even feel them hit. It's just a nice one, Dave. Oh, yeah, nice one. That's a good start. Very, very pretty fish. On that little tiny grub, nice little lure. Now, Al, you said Mary wants a couple of these for yeah, eating? Yeah, I'd like to keep enough, but that's a marginal size one. We'll keep him and I'm okay, going to eat him. number one. You know what? Yeah, you know, that that was your third cast, David. Yeah. Third cast, and we haven't been out all, all all season. Third cast, he got that fish. Fish. My second cast on this little baby x raft. I'm going to fish back through there again. I had one fish that followed that looked like a crappie. I'm almost sure it was. Another one? Yep. Another little guy. I, I'll take them. Just, just throw them in there. I'll, I'll eat those. Right. It's a good fillet size. It's getting respectable in here. We're covering water to contact fish using slow swimming retrieves to skim the weed tops without snagging. First up is a variety of mini crankbaits that dive just a few feet deep on your retreat. Rapple and Storm both make assorted lures that imitate minnows or young or small forage species. It's tough to beat a 132nd or 16th ounce jig with a curly tail. Marabou dressing or other subtle jigs work well too. Jigs allow you to pause your retrieve and drop the bait down into holes or alongside clumps, just in case the fish are down and lazy instead of up and active. We're tossing small, lightweight baits that can really be tough to cast if you don't have the right setup. We prefer a six and a half to seven foot light action quantum rod with a size 10 reel. This can cast these small baits really far and detect subtle bites. Four to six pound mono like Suffolk's Elite is a good choice. Cast and swim, pause and flutter. Try a combination of lure retrieves until you get it right. The fish will tell you what they want. Looking, 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 look. I got her, got her. Oh, she's a tanker. She's a tanker, Dave. <laughs> she came flapping in at those deep weeds. You can actually see them. This is one of them really big gals, man. These are the kind that you don't want to put into the, in the live well. In the live well. I mean, she's a big fish. I even got to reach down and grab her. Look at that one. <laughs> That's a big, big one there, man. Look at that. Look at that crappie. 
<laughs> that. Now that was fun. Look at the size of that mouth. They, they got no problem eating, eating crankbaits or big hair jigs. You know, we mixed uh, uh, the baits up quite a bit today. And this time of the year, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about uh, uh, this, this pre-spawn mo movement, a, t a time where, where, where there's a, an early pre-spawn, a mid pre-spawn, and a late pre-spawn. And based on local weather and water conditions, these things do a lot of different things. Let's talk about those three uh, uh, periods of time and basic movement based on local weather and water conditions, particularly in natural lakes like this. I'm gonna put her back. That was fun, man. The early stages of pre-spawn are all about crappies gathering outside spring feeding areas and making their first tentative moves into the shallows once the weather stabilizes and the shallows begin to warm. With stable weather, crappies may begin to penetrate the extreme shallows after just a few days of calm, sunny weather. If so, look for them in shoreline brush, reeds, or other shallow cover. More likely though, Unstable spring weather will see them making a week or more of tentative movements in and out of the shallows, relating to perimeter cover like weeds or dropping down into depressions or holes when less active. That's the situation we're fishing today. The fish are still basically out, but showing signs of wanting to come in. Basically, we're fishing temporary holding and feeding areas along their way into the shallows. Fish the areas with the best cover at just the right depth and you'll find the fish. By mid pre-spawn, most of the fish will have moved quite shallow into classic flooded wood or reed cover. Because spooky crappies are reluctant to leave the cover, classic bobber techniques are best for tempting them to bite. By late pre-spawn, crappies in natural lakes often shift to deep reed beds to begin building nests in areas with a mixture of sand and soft bottom, where broken reeds form overhead cover for protection from birds and other predators like Careful. you. Ooh, that's a that was a harder big one, big one, big one, big crappie, big, big crappie. I actually thought it might have been a bass because he hit so big hard. Big crappie. Wow, nice one, man. Look how pretty that is, man. Ooh. After a long cold winter, that's the breath. Wow, look at that, man. Well, Mary's eating good tonight, Al. If elusive slab crappies evade your fishing efforts, Crappie Logic details the proper rigging, bait, tackle, and fishing strategies for locating and catching these calico beauties all year long. Hey, it's part of our Angling Edge instructional DVD collection, available at anglingedge.com. <laughs>taking you where the fish are but now the silence is about to break with the incredible new iPilot link your Minn Kota and Hummingbird can communicate with each other so you can hold on a spot like an electronic anchor record and return to waypoints and paths follow any lake master depth contour and more all automatically and all from your Hummingbird or the link remote they talk and you'll be speechless For over 65 years, Lund has had an unwavering commitment to build the finest fishing boats on the water. 65 years of dedication, innovation, passion. Lund boats stand up to the elements and the use hardcore anglers put them through season after season. Built by fishermen for fishermen. Welcome to the Inner Circle. Rotating coverage up to 300 feet gives you a detailed 360 degree view of structure, contour changes, and fish. So you can see them before they see you. Introducing 360 Imaging, only from Hummingbird.
The Edge is presented by these and other fine sponsors. Much of your success on the water is related to the reliability of your equipment. Poor or dysfunctional gear usually results in an unpleasant experience. We've all been down that road, and as seasons pass, we hope to get better at the game. Ice fishing requires lots of gear and a high cylinder index to be mobile. Much of our ice fishing equipment sits for months on end without use. So we use seafoam motor treatment in all the fuel we run through our ice augers, sleds, four-wheelers, and even trucks. It does the few important things extremely well. It will stabilize fuel for up to two years, preventing both phase separation and the formation of varnish. It helps clean harmful deposits from carburetors, jets, and injectors. It controls moisture, lubricates upper cylinders, and most of all, ensures your motors are starting and running right. Adding seafoam motor treatment in each tank also makes storage easy. So when you're done for the season, you can trust that the engine is clean, the fuel is fresh, and the cylinders will be ready to fire when you need them to. We're late ice fishing, you know, and over the course of a season, we really fish for a wide variety of different fish through the ice, huh? Northern uh -huh. pike, walleyes, panfish. We even catch bass through the ice. But right now, Jeremy and I are going to look at uh, catching probably a, a fish that uh, it's not really unknown, but uh, not a lot of people fish for them. It's catfish, and we're talking big ones through the ice. It's sort of an interesting story because it wasn't that long ago we caught these same fish about five miles that way. Today, anglers have tremendous resources available to find new fishing hotspots. Trap net and gill net surveys done by the Department of Natural Resources in states across the country can provide a wealth of information. This particular reservoir has a lot of channel cats in the 25 to 29 inch category. These numbers inspired us to check out this particular watershed. Our initial research mission in this area started in July. See one in there, Jim? Whoa. Oh, whoa, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> what? <laughs> Roly poly. Wow. You got one too? No, no. Snagged up? No, I'm just pulling mine, getting mine out of the way since Oh, you're, you're since such you're, a nice guy. You're, you're, since you're bothering me. <laughs> Boy, are they tough. Look at that current. Whew. Bothering me. Whoa. Look at them rolling out there. What a deal. Oh, and then they did. Yeah. Boy, look, look how stoked. I mean, it's just unbelievable. N normally, you, we don't we don't fish in for one thing in, in rivers wow. that are uh, this clear of water. That's one thing that's sort of intriguing. Look how fat those fish that are. That is just amazing. And like Jim said, this is not too long after the spawn, and to see them already looking this big is really, really, really impressive. There, look at that, huh? Again, Jim and I are fishing right now in, the, in a small river that's above a reservoir and in late summer this is definitely the peak place to find numbers of big catfish like this, but that changes throughout the course of the season, so let's explore that. Like all river fish, cats make dramatic seasonal moves. In general, throughout the cold water period, cats tend to gather in the deepest holes in any given river section. Today, we're fishing a small river that feeds a reservoir. A lot of these fish will actually migrate out of the river into the deeper water in the reservoir. The distance between summer fishing areas and ice fishing areas is only about five miles. Whoa, 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 look at them go. That's, I mean, those guys, they can really <laughs> move pretty quickly, considering that it's probably about. It's moving. 39 degrees down there, it's pretty cold. You'd think that cats though. would be really, everybody, you know, consider them to be a warm water, sort of a lethargic fish. Yep, got them, got them. They're em. eating pretty good through the, Decent. under the ice. We fish them in some other reservoirs yeah, and we yeah. catch them a lot of times suspended over really cold, deep yeah. water nice one, around the perimeter of a 50 foot ooh, hole ooh. and we catch them almost like crappies suspended anywhere between, you know, 15 to 20 foot down a lot, over 30 to 40, 50 foot of water. A lot of fish in the summer. Wow, look at he's got mud on him. Whoa. 
Yeah. You see, these guys are serious fish. Your drag's getting to work out. Yeah. Huh. Boy, you can feel it. Look at his big head pump on them. If you like to eat mm. fish, if you like catfish, that'd be a perfect one. Throw on the table. That's a real beauty there. Oh, there he goes. Oh, look at that guy there. He's a bingy, too. Oh, wow. Come here. Look at that guy. Whoa. <laughs> that guy there is a, a pretty serious one, Jer. Oh, look at that guy nice. there. Nice. They're sort of hard to get hold of. Look at that beautiful fish, though. Look at that. Gorgeous. Look at that guy there. Obviously, fish location is the key to catching any type of fish, and fish in rivers really move a lot over the course of the year. Like Jim mentioned, we caught fish way up in the river in the middle of summer, and that's where a lot of fish in this reservoir will spend the warm water period. But as the water cools, the fish will make their way out of that shallow river environment and settle into deeper water areas within the reservoir. Now there's a lot of areas in, within this particular reservoir that are say 15 to 20 feet deep. And even at the bottom end, just above the dam, there's 30 feet of water and naturally, we thought the fish would be somewhere around that 30 foot, foot of water, the deepest water available. Well, we came out in the fall and we scanned the entire thing with our sonar and really didn't find much. And we started making our way up and down the reservoir, searching with electronics. And where we're fishing right now is actually a location that in November, we were out here dragging jigs and ended up catching a lot of catfish. But if you're looking for them, deeper water, somewhere along a channel edge within a reservoir is usually a great place to start to find them. Oh, see, see if you drop it down, oh, darn. Up here he comes. Yeah, better off. Yep. Put it in the, uh... Yep. That was sweet. When it comes to ice fishing for cats, many baits work. Jim's using an eighth ounce VMC Moon Eye jig with a piece of cut shiner. I prefer using spoons like the Lure Jensen Hus Lure and Flash Champ spoon. Rapala's jigging wraps are another great option if the fish are active. Now we never go out on the ice without Frayville tip-ups. These allow you to have an extra line in the water and sometimes that lack of movement is what they prefer. Oh, here he comes, here he comes. You're getting close, Jim. Oh, oh there he is, yeah, you can see his head. He's a, wow, this that's is a, a giant. Fish. Look yep. at, there he is, oh yeah, look yeah, at that guy there. Oh, thank yeah. you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, now you're talking, I'll pop it. That was perfect, I like that. Then I don't even have to handle it. <laughs> Look at those barbells, aren't yeah. they something? Boy, they're blue boy. Is yeah. that a pretty one? Yeah. Look at that thing. Yeah. Look at it, he's talking to you too. Wow. wow. Is he tough? Just thick, tough, what? Gosh, oh, no. Everything bites beneath the ice, and ice fishing hard water location patterns explains how to locate and catch panfish, walleyes, trout, and more during the winter months. It's part of our Angling Edge instructional DVD collection, available at anglingedge.com. Suffolk Safe 32 is constructed with seven strands of Dyneema and a single strand of Gore Performance Fiber. It's the roundest, longest casting line in the world. It offers superior abrasion resistance so you can fish it anywhere. It's the strongest, most sensitive, and durable small diameter braid ever to hit the water. Nice fish, Brett. Thanks. Suffix 832. Always use the best line. There she is, my first Mercury. 154 stroke, the lightweight heavyweight. And she comes with all this. Say hi to Wendy from customer support. She's always there to help. Jerry from product testing, he dishes out the torture. They can take it. Good. And Tim from design, he never misses a detail. Obsessed with quality. Bobby, prop engineer, he turns horsepower into performance. This is George. From it's good to have Mercury behind you. Meet the rest of the team at mercurymarine.com. You're gonna need a bigger boat. Really? You're seriously just gonna leave me in here? 
Yeah, I'm fishing deep today, Ike. Are you kidding me? These are perfect conditions for pulling big bass out of heavy cover. Yeah? Heck yeah! Try one of these weedless wacky jigs. All right, yeah. It, it has an offset hook and stainless steel weed guard. Whoa! <laughs> ah. Sorry, Ike. Flip it in there, and its wacky action will have you pulling out one fat bass after another. Please! I can't say anything. The Edge is presented by these and other fine sponsors. Hey, if you're a regular viewer of The Edge, you know I close every segment off with an inspirational message that usually refers in some way, shape, or form to the Bible. Because I do a closing like this, I get bunches of emails and letters from people, and people send me uh, 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 different books to read and booklets and say, hey, maybe you'd find this interesting. This has really happened, happened to have an impact on my life in a positive way. So I get a lot of stuff. One of them that I got that I really enjoy is titled, Topics for Bible Study and Personal Growth. This is a real whopper. This guy really went through some pains to send me this. And it's got 80 specific teachings in it. And uh, the guy's an avid bass fisherman from a small town in Minnesota. And in addition to sending me the booklet, he sent me a whole bunch of pictures of uh, a big bass that he catches. Gave me some good lakes to come and take a look at that. I really appreciate it. But one of these messages, I just want to read you a little snippet of it because I really found it interesting. It was titled, When Silence is Loud. And it starts out, does God stop speaking or do we stop listening? Have you ever turned on a TV program or a movie that was already started? It doesn't make much sense unless you saw the beginning. The same thing happens when we try to skip too far ahead of God's will. Something is missing and it can seem like God is silent. We need to go back to where we last knew we were in God's will and pick it up from there. The Lord's will is like walking up the stairs, one step at a time. We respond to God, then He responds to us, then us to Him, and Him to us. It's like taking turns. <laughs> Have we dug our feet in regard to God's will or gotten in a rut? God may seem silent. Is God telling us something we don't want to hear? So we block it out? Do we only listen to God when he says what we want? Has he been repeating himself so many times on something that we no longer hear it? And then there's one sentence that really caught my attention. The words common sense are not mentioned in a Bible that I've ever seen. Yet it is God's voice for the very most part. I really thought that was a great read. Many of them are great and I really want to Thank you, Mike, for sending me this. It's been a blessing to me. Hey, from all of us here at The Edge, you have a good, safe fishing season. We'll see you on the water. Hey, I want to take a moment to thank you for watching. And if you really like what you see, we got a whole lot more. So check us out at any one of these online outlets.